Alyssa Allen is the founder of Mycopigments. She specializes in teaching people about how to find, recognize, and utilize fungi for dyes. Over the past 20 years, she's taught fungal ecology, mushroom identification, and mushroom and lichen dyeing to countless students in three countries and 25 states. In 2015, she created the Mushroom and Lichen Dyers United Discussion Group and the Mushroom Dyers Trading Post, bringing together a vibrant community of over 9,500 members. Alyssa's mission is to inspire people to engage more deeply with nature so they can pass their knowledge and experience on to future generations. I'm so happy that Alyssa could be with us tonight and share with you her love and technique, techniques for using mushrooms as dyes. Thank you so much, Joanne. I'm, it's so hard to not be down there with you guys for an actual fungus fair, but this is the next best thing. And I'm glad that you guys have pulled this off because it's a, it's a pretty big thing to undertake. So thank you for having me. Our pleasure. So I'm just gonna get started here. Um, this is uh, an example of California uh, mushroom dye palette. And there are a couple of lichens as well. Um, and as you can see, the colors are very vibrant. This is not particularly special to California. You can get vibrant colors from pretty much all regions of the US and probably beyond. Um, this talk is mostly focused on um, mushroom dyes of the U.S. So people always ask me how I got started in, um, how I got interested in mushroom dyes. And I'm going to go back to before I was born. <laughs> and as you can see, I'm a little toddler in this photo. Um, but this is four generations, my great grandmother, my grandmother, and my mother. And I did not realize this, but my great grandmother was a granny square extraordinaire. And somehow it skipped two generations, but I inherited this gene. This is pretty much what I do with mushroom dyed fibers. I make granny square hats. And, um, and I, apparently that's where I got it from. I didn't realize that until just a few years ago. And I thought it was quite funny. So I got my start with mushroom dyeing when I was, or with mushrooms when I was a small child. Um, I was about four years old when my mom got the National Audubon Society's Field Guide to Mushrooms. And this was like my treasure hunting book. Uh, we would go out into the forest and I would look for all of these mushrooms. Uh, and I spent years of my early childhood focusing on this. Um, it wasn't until much later in life that I realized this book is kind of um, East Coast centric and that a lot of the mushrooms described in the book didn't occur in my region in the Pacific Northwest, but that didn't stop me from trying to find them. When I was about 20, I joined the Puget Sound Mycological Society. And just like a lot of people who get their start, I was pretty focused on eating mushrooms. Uh, this is me swooning over a bowl of slippery jacks, one of the most disgusting edible mushrooms out there. And, uh, but you couldn't tell me that at the time, I was so excited to find these in the local park near my house. And um, that's kind of how I got involved with PSMS. But I quickly found out that I would go on these forays looking for edible mushrooms, but I was very easily distracted by all of the other exciting, interesting fungi out there. And the closer you look, the more details you see. And I couldn't fill a basket of edible mushrooms for the life of me, but I could bring home uh, a variety of very interesting fungi. So when I found out about mushrooms for dyes, I found that in my basket of interesting fungi, I had already collected several dye mushrooms. So I go out looking for chanterelles and I come home with a handful of dog turd fungus and a basket full of all sorts of different interesting things. Not too long ago, I went on a foray for morels 
and no morels were to be had, but my basket was still full. And this is a sampling of the colors that I collect from the mushrooms that I collected that day. And people were happy to get on board with the foraging for dye fungi because there just weren't any morels out there. So um, some of these colors are from the coral fungi, um, Romaria, and there's some Gymnopolis in there, Dyer's polypore, and a little bit of Cortinarius. So as you can see, a large amount of color for a relatively dry year with not a lot of fungi. But what pulled me over to mushroom dyeing was really the um, possibility for all these brilliant colors. So I'm just gonna start by talking about the simplest way to get these colors extracted. And I refer to this as folk dyeing. It's basically just taking some mushrooms and throwing them in a pot with um, some protein fiber, which is like wool and silk and um, simmering it for an hour and getting color. And so mushroom dyeing can be as easy as just simply throwing some fiber and fungi in a pot. Protein fibers, wool, wool yarn, silk fabric, silk yarn, and other protein fibers like hair. And I put this picture in here because it's just such a beautiful example of lobster mushroom on human hair. But dyes are most concentrated on wool, uh, wool either from sheep or goat. People do attempt to get colors on cotton. And these are some really ex exceptional examples of linen and cotton cellulose fiber dyes, um, or cellulose fiber dyed with mushrooms. This is using Michelle Garcia's technique. And I mostly focus on wool and silk. So I'm not exactly sure what all uh, Michelle Garcia's process entails, but I think that it has something to do with um, treating the cellulose fiber with a protein, usually soy milk. Um, and it's a, it's a longer process and the colors are a little bit more pastel, although these are just brilliant representations. On the right, um, Pisolithus arises on Dharma's Dharma Trading Company, um, it's a fiber company, if you're not familiar with them, they sell um, a prepared cotton fabric called PFD. Um, I was very skeptical, but the student of mine threw this into the, um, the Pisolithus Arises dye pot and out came this brilliant orange. So there, there are potentials for dyeing cellulose fibers, um, but I prefer to stick with the animal fibers. These are some examples of some contemporary experiments done by Russell DeGrove. Uh, these are cotton t-shirts. And my understanding is it takes four gallons of uh, Viola Schweinitzii to get the green on the shirt on the right. So uh, I could be wrong about that. Maybe it's four to one by weight, um, but it takes a lot more fungus to get a lighter color in the end. But as you can see, there's a lot of potential for experimentation with this work. So what you need to get started, first of all, you need to find some mushrooms, preferably an abundant species that has some color to it. This is an example of Cortinarius smithii. It's a very vibrant dye maker, um, but experimenting for the first time, you wanna find something that's got a little bit of color to it. In general, white mushrooms, tan mushrooms, brown mushrooms, they're, they're not the best for um, getting a good strong uh, reaction in the dye pot. So look for some colorful things. You're going to need to get out into some habitat. So these are some examples of different forest types from all over the U.S. There's um, in the upper left hand corner, that's a uh, some forest in Maine where we found lots of Cortinarius and all sorts of dye mushrooms. In the middle is an example of Washington State Forest. On the right, um, we have coastal Washington Pacific Northwest Forest. Uh, in the middle left, that's down in Georgia. Uh, 
Then in the middle is Southern California. On the right is New England. And on the left is um, Northern California. So really you just need to get out and find some good habitat. These are all places that I've found good dye fungi. You need to get some regional field guides. For California, these are the two books that I recommend. You're really fortunate to have your very own California lichen book. Not everybody has an identification guide built for their region. And this is a really particularly beautiful book. And of course, Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast by Christian Schwarz and Noah Siegel, both who are speakers for the, um, for the event this week. Um, this is truly the best book for the Northwest region uh, all the way up to, um, well, Southern Canada, coastal Canada down to Monterey. And then as far as mushroom dye resource material, there's not a whole lot out there. These are the three books that I recommend. There are a few others and there are some Scandinavian books, but um, these are what I got started with and they're really um, good resource material. Rainbow Beneath My Feet by Arlene and Alan Bissett, um, Miriam Rice's books, Mushrooms for Color and Mushrooms for Dyes, Paper, Pigments and Myco Sticks. Uh, Mushrooms for Color, is probably, well, that's that's the book that I had when I got first started and it goes through um, recipes, but they're basically suggestions. Um, not really, there's, there's not a lot of, um, you know, take this amount of mushroom to this amount of fiber and add these modifiers and pHs um, and you'll get these results. It's more like, more vague suggestions. So we still have a lot of um, information to document out there. And I've been working on a book myself. Um, my book will have firsthand species descriptions, detailed photographs, up-to-date names, effects of pH modification, distribution maps, and full recipes. Not really sure when it's gonna be out, but I'm hoping for 2021. It's really important that if you have a local resource like a mycological society to join up, that's where I learned most, everything I know about <laughs> mycology. I got started with Puget Sound Mycological Society. At the time they had free identification classes and I just took them over and over again. I joined the board and encouraged others. I did as much as I could within the club to gain as much knowledge as quickly as possible. And I had to relearn everything because I had been studying the Audubon book since childhood and had filled my head with um, things that I thought I knew, but uh, had to reprogram and to things that were actual, actually factual. And lastly, you need to have some patience and the desire to learn. Getting started with mushroom dyeing can be very frustrating at first. Um, this line of the rainbow of fungi that these guys are working on, uh, out of those mushrooms, maybe two are dye producers. The orange one in, um, on the right-hand side, the woolly vase chanterelle or false chanterelle, um, that is one of the dyers and it, gives, it looks orange, but it gives a purple dye. So fungi are tricky. They, the chemistry is um, not what you would expect. You throw this thing into the dye pot, the dye water is pretty much clear. The yarn comes out a uh, smoky violet. We're gonna get on to literally dyeing. So when you're working with fungi, you can work with either fresh mushrooms or dry fungi. I prefer to work with dry because I can make um, a recipe that I can depend on. When you work with fresh mushrooms, there's a lot of things, um, um, considerations to be made. How much water is in the fungus when you found it? Is it um, like this lobster mushroom? These things are giant. They're full of white fungus that actually doesn't contain any um, dye pigments, all of the pigments on the outside. So if you were to try to use these lobster mushrooms fresh, you wouldn't know how much to put into the dye pot to get a good solid color because there's just too many variables. But if you take 
this fungus, peel off all of the dye material, which is just the outside of that lobster mushroom and dry it out and then weigh it, you know that by one to one by weight will give you a good solid color almost every time. So that's how I prefer to work with fungi. There are very few mushrooms that, that don't work well dried just as well as they do fresh. So um, very few exceptions to that rule. The extraction is pretty simple. You simmer the mushrooms for an hour. You can either strain them or leave them in the pot. Um, I generally leave them in the pot and get my mushrooms and fiber all mixed in together because I like the texture of the mushrooms pressing up against the wool. It gives the yarn just a little bit of variation, variegation and um, kind of a richer color experience. But if you don't want any um, bits and pieces in your yarn, then you can just strain it out or put it into a mesh bag. I use paint strainer bags, similar to um, winemaking bags. They're just, um, just really fine fabric and it keeps the mushroom bits out of the, fi out of the fiber. So you simmer that for an hour and then you put your fungus, your fiber into that dye bath and you simmer it for another hour. So if you haven't used natural dyes before, there is another additive that natural dyers use and these are called mordants. Mordants are mineral salts and they intensify and shift the colors. So they are used to bring about color change to the fibers. They don't have color themselves necessarily. You can see uh, a slight difference in some of the mordants and others you just don't see the, re the reaction at all, but it permanently binds to that fiber and makes the fiber uh, react to the dyes differently. So this is, uh, you don't have to use mordants for a lot of these fungi, but if you wanna get really bright reds and deep blues, you do need to use the mordants. So I usually work with alum and iron. These are both non-toxic and easy to come by. There are a couple other mordants out there that people tend to use, tin and, co and um, copper. And those are a little bit trickier to work with. So I just, if you're getting started, just stick with alum and iron. Those are both food grade additives and safe to use. That said, they are powders. And whenever you're working with powders, you do wanna be careful because inhaling any powder can be dangerous to do. And that's, I'm talking baby powder and flour and anything. So, um, work in a well-ventilated area, or now that we have these handy masks that everybody's wearing, you can just put on a mask and keep that powder down. So in addition to the mordants, um, which are mineral salts, you can also modify the color using pH modifiers. In most, generally I use um, vinegar or washing soda. You can also use ammonia or um, if you have lye, you can use that. Or if you have stale urine, you can use that, but it's not as strong um, for the alkaline reaction. For acid, you can use citric acid, vinegar, lemon juice, anything that's acidic. Acids tend to brighten the yellow and orange dyes. And then alkaline tends to make the blue green colors and uh, deepen reds and to purples. And here's an example of what mordants do for a single dye source. So this is the dyer's polypore. Over on the left, the, at the very top, that, dye, that fiber has been treated with alum and you get a nice deep gold. In the middle and the paler colors, those are no mordant. And then you can see the gradation go to nice deep forest green. That is by adding an iron mordant. And I'll talk about how to do the mordantine in a second. Mordantine can be done in a couple of ways. Pre-mordantine is one of the ways, and I'll tell you how to do that in just a moment. But 
it's essential that you pre-mordant if you want to get um, these bright blue colors. This is from a mushroom called Sarcodon fusco indicus, and it can be found in the Humboldt area. This is a red example using Quaternaria sanguineus that I got from Sweden. This is pre-mordanted with alum. So to pre-mordant, and this is what I, I pre-mordant almost everything. Natural dyers do these things different across the board. So there's no right way or wrong way. And mushroom dyeing is so young in that we don't have a lot of documentation. Basically plant dyeing techniques were borrowed and applied to mushroom dyeing when mushroom dyeing was first published in the 1970s. So um, there's so much room for experimentation and I encourage everybody to just find what feels right for you and document that. So for me, I pre-mordant almost all of my fiber before dyeing it. And I do this in one of two ways. Um, I have done for years, I've done a hot pre-mordant where you simmer the fiber with the mordant powder at a certain uh, ratio of the weight of fiber to the mordant. And it's different depending on which mineral salt you're using. So for alum, I do about 15% to the weight of fiber. So that's just, a, all of these are very small amounts. And for iron, I do a 2% to the weight of fiber. So I simmer that mordant until it dissolves. And then I add the fiber and I simmer that for an hour. And when I say simmer, it's about 180 degrees. If you don't have a thermometer, that's just like small bubbles, not a rolling boil. So I used to do it that way. And then I started experimenting with cold mordantine. And I actually prefer it because it seems to be less damaging to the fiber. And so basically you dissolve the mordant in hot water. And I just use the hottest tap water I can get. I put it, um, the mordant in there, I dissolve it. And then I add the fiber to the, like a buck. I usually do this in a bucket. And I put it in my shower and I just let it sit there. Uh, every time I go to the bathroom, I go in and I stir it. And in the morning, it's all mordanted and ready to go. And you just drain the water out and you let the fiber dry. And that mordant is permanently bound to that fiber. So with this pre-mordanted fiber, I make tester bundles. And this is how I figure out what colors I'm going to get from fungi. Now there are a few books out there, like I said before, but I found that I trust my own experiments more than the results from these books. So I just test everything. Anything that I have questions about, I test it. And I found that um, there's a lot of work to be done with these dye mushrooms. So um, the two questions that testing answers is, is this even a dye mushroom? Does this mushroom contain dye? And if so, what is the best route to color? And so I have these tester bundles. Each strand is a different mordant. And you can see at the ends of each strand, there's a different number of knots assigned to that color. And the colors you can see are tan and green uh, on the right hand uh, strand. This is undyed on the right-hand side and then dyed on the left-hand side. And so each of those colors represents a different mordant treatment. So the only two that you can actually see are copper and iron. So iron makes kind of a rust, makes your wool look kind of rusty and copper makes it look kind of like a copper penny or copper rooftop. It has that green patina. And you can't see alum and you can't see tin. So I do all of these in my tester bundles because I want to know with all of the mordants. But if you're just getting started with alum and iron, you're just going to have a three strand bundle. And that's a good place to start. I also don't tie knots in there anymore because that is so tedious. Now I just cut my strands at different lengths. So I do the shortest one is unmordanted, second longest is iron, and the third longest is alum. And it's just that easy. So I make these little pre-mordanted tester bundles. And when they come out of the dye, as you can see on the left-hand um, example, all of the yarns are different colors. And from that, I can say, okay, the first one that's beige, that has no mordant. And it's what I call a dye dud coined from, 
Arlene Bassett's book. Um, it, it's beige. For me, that's not a dye color. The second one is alum. It has one knot and that's a nice deep green. I like that color. The third one is iron. It has two knots. Eh, it's okay. The fourth one is tin and it's this nice blue color. That's pretty good to know. And then the fifth one is copper and it's kind of, it's not a lot, it's not very different from the alum. So copper's the least convenient for me to use. So I just, it's basically just a reference point. But if I was gonna look at that, answering my question, yes, it is a good dye mushroom. And the best route to color for me would be alum or tin. And so that's what I would do with that mushroom. Now, if I were to just test with an unmordanted piece of wool, it would have come out beige. And I might have just thrown the whole thing out and said, eh, not a good dye mushroom. So this demonstrates the importance of doing your testing with mordants. So this is an example of some testing that I did with coral fungi. And my question was, um, what, where is the dye contained? Is it in the older fungi or is it in the younger fungi? Is it in the tips of the coral or is it in the base of the coral? And all of these jars are figuring that out. And these are the tester bundles um, from my experiments along with the coral that I used. And basically that experiment told me that the color is in the tips of the young specimens. So playing around with these, with these fungi and figuring these things out is, um, it's a rewarding process. Red gilled court, this is Cortinarius uh, smithii. And when I do my tester bundles with this mush mushroom, these are the colors. So this is um, just alum and iron tests. And you can see uh, with a vinegar modification, pH four, that's acid, you're gonna get bright orange. With just neutral, you get this beautiful um, vinaceous red and deep indigo blue. And when you up the pH with an alkaline solution, either ammonia or washing soda to pH nine, you're gonna get more purpley colors. So a lot of different variety just with two mordants and pH modification. Porcini, these guys are a little bit too old for eating. So that means we're gonna test them in the dye pot. And I was really surprised with this mushroom because I had been extracting it in an alkaline solution for years uh, for my classes. And uh, when you add an alkaline solution to this dye bath, it goes from being kind of a clear lemon yellow solution to this deep auburn, dark yellow, beautiful dye bath. But when you pull the fiber out, it doesn't really stick to the yarn. So I was blown away that by adding an acid, which makes the dye bath look even more clear and less visible dye colors in the dye bath, all of there's somehow magical chemistry that happens that turns your yarn in even deeper color. So playing around with actual experiments rather than just making assumptions based on what you see in the dye pot is really, um, I encourage you to try that. I really love working with regional dye palettes. And this is uh, Lisa Waterman in her experiments with her local um, Bay Area fungi. And she's woven these into little swatches. Each one represents a species of fungus and all of the mordants and um, different treatments that she's done to get the different colors. And she uses this as a teaching tool for her weaving guild. And this just makes my heart sore. Regional dye work, again, this is up in Fort St. James, British Columbia. Kristen Cooper Nut Brown contacted me and asked me to teach a class up there. She said, I don't know if I have any dye fungi, but I'd love to find out. She says, I think I found a dyer's polypore. 
So I got up there. She had so much dye fungi and including Hapalopolis, which is not commonly found on the West Coast. So she was very excited. And her goal was to make a sweater with only local dye fungi. And she whipped this out within the year after I came to visit. It was so amazing. Um, not every region has such a wide variety of color as the picture that you saw in the very beginning. This is the Southern California dye palette, and this is on both wool and alpaca. And it's not as vast. These are just mushrooms. When you throw lichens in there, you get some more vibrant colors, but um, they don't have the reds and the blue greens. But you see that there's a lot of color and I just, there's something really special about your own not your own mushroom dye palette. So when you get interested in looking for dye fungi, this thing happens where you start noticing all the fungi because you're you're on a treasure hunt, you're on a mission. And while you're on that mission, you're going to want to know what you have. And you're also going to want to hopefully contribute to community science. Um, I encourage people to upload their photos onto iNaturalist, both to get an identification and to put the collection on the map. And don't worry, your spot isn't going to be disclosed to the world. You can put a shield on your particular special location that you collected it, and, and it, everybody will see kind of a general area where it was collected. This is so important. Um, I just recently looked up Quartinarius neosanguineus, and there were just a few collections in Washington state. I know this mushroom occurs more frequently than is documented, but the more documentation we have, the better. And so I just encourage you to get on iNaturalist, open up an account. It's a great tool for keeping track of your collections, contributing to community science, and then also it allows other people to access your data and build on their own um, research. It's a win-win for everybody. So there are a few online resources. Um, these are mine, mycopigments.com. You can kind of check out what I'm up to these days, which unfortunately with COVID and everything, um, I am just kind of laying low and working on projects at home. But I do plan to come up with some small scale workshops, uh, socially distanced kind of events with just a handful of people and um, always interested in helping new dyers learn what they're working with in their own regional dye palettes. Um, and I do most of that outreach on Mushroom and Lichen Dyers United, which is up to over 9,000 members. And it's just so exciting to see all of the progress that's happened over the last 10 years in mushroom dyeing. And I love bringing people together and having folks learn from each other and build on these concepts. Uh, it just, it really warms my heart to see the enthusiasm that's out there. Um, if you're looking for dye mushrooms, there's the Mushroom Dyers Trading Post. Uh, a couple pro tips for that. Uh, the Dyer's Polypore is pretty much everywhere right now. And I've seen a lot of people trying to trade for, trying to get rid of it in hopes of getting other fungi. But if you really want to place some value on that mushroom, wait until spring when nobody has that coming up. Um, and your mushroom will be, will take um, on a new value. So a lot of people out there looking for lobster mushrooms and all sorts of dye fungi. And I encourage people to get on Mushroom Dyer's Trading Post and see, see if there's something you're interested in, see if there's something that you might have that you'd like to offer. Um, as long as one part of the trade is mushroom dye related, the other part of the trade can be just about anything. Some of my favorite parts of uh, Mushroom and Lichen Dyers United is seeing beginners have successful beginnings. So this is the jack-o'-lantern fungus on the left, and it's notoriously difficult to get that purple the first time. And see folks find that mushroom and access that purple, that beautiful, the first time. 
Um, this is an example from Lindsay Best. Uh, it just, it's amazing. It's so, it makes me so happy to see. Um, and then another highlight is uh, I had a contest a while back to figure out the ancient recipe for using urine and lichen to get the historical purple that everybody talks about. Uh, but I couldn't find any actual recipes and written accounts of getting this purple other than just uh, anecdotal, anecdotal references. So put the contest out there and it was amazing. There are several people who participated and everybody kind of got different results. But Sue Gazelle uh, in Tennessee got this beautiful purple, documented her results and was able to claim the prize, which was a sampling of the best fungi, dye fungi from all over North America. So now we're gonna get into a little bit of how you work with identifying mushrooms. Um, I know there's a lot of different experience levels probably tuned in. So this might be a review for a lot of people, uh, but just the basics of getting started with mushroom identification. So you wanna look at your mushroom closely. Notice any sort, of, um, any sort of ornamentation, what's going on at the base of the stem, uh, what's going on at the top of the stem. Is there a veil? Is there a skirt around th the stem? Is there warts on the top of the cap? Is it rough? Is it smooth? Is it slimy? Is it dry? What's it growing on? Is it growing on wood? Is it growing out of the dirt? Um, these are some of the things that you want to take note of. Observe, photograph, and take note. This is a photo by Noah Siegel of Cortinaria smithii. I've collected this mushroom for years and never noticed this beautiful golden veil. So slowing down to take a look and, and observe and document these notable features. Um, it's rewarding in both that it'll help with your identification, but it's also just such a pleasure to see. So you wanna look at the undersides. Fungi have all different kinds of undersides from gills to pores, spines or teeth, we call those. And cutting your mushroom in half will often reveal things that you didn't even know were lurking under the surface. This is the dead man's foot or pyzolithus. Arises, cut in half, you can see the little packets of spores called peridials. These are some of the things that fungi do <laughs> that will help you identify what group of fungi, where it kind of helps you rule out what these things are not. So if you cut the gills and it's oozing latex, you know that it's not a whole lot of things and it can narrow down what you're looking at to a particular group. And in this case, it's lactarius. Slime, these, some fungi have slime like you wouldn't believe. These droplets are called gutations. Um, sometimes they're colorful, sometimes they're clear. Noting these ephemeral features before you throw it in your basket will go a long way in helping you with your identification. You want to get a spore print. And this was just a lovely example of the spore print uh, the spores being dropped from the gills down onto the slimy veil. And you can see there's just like a thin layer of orange, rusty orange spores left on that veil. Um, so I didn't even have to do a spore print on this because it was already done in nature for me. And this tells me that it's in the Cortinarius family. Unfortunately, it's not a dye mushroom. You have to do the dye test to figure that out. But um, this will help you get some identification features down. So to do a spore print, you simply place the cap on a piece of paper and cover it and leave it overnight. And the spores will be ejected from those gills and leave a deposit on your piece of paper. I usually use white paper. Even if the spore print is white, you can usually see some sort of um, remnants of the spores if they're, if they're being released. So this was just a paper plate that was left out from the fungus fair, and I thought it was a beautiful example. So California dye mushrooms. In this basket, you have a full spectrum of color. These were all collected on the same day. So you should get out there and 
experiment. I'm just gonna go through some of the groups of fungi and in rainbow order. So Cortinarius neosanguineus, the dark red, um, blood red dicort, it gives the best color, but it's one of the hardest mushrooms to find. I've only found it in really dark places and it's so small that it's hard to recognize. Cortinaria smithii, this should be coming out, starting to come out now and uh, gives these lovely colors down on the right hand bottom. Cortinarius californicus, this is a mushroom that can be confused for the other two, but uh, is, as you can see that specimen in the middle is changing to kind of a lighter red color. It does this as it dries out and the other fungi do not. So Cortinarius californicus gives kind of a more um, salmon-y color. Orange dermosa bees or orange gilled quartz, these uh, give a wide range of colors. I never really bother trying to identify these to species because I think their uh, taxonomy is in flux, but these are my ex my samples that I dyed from different regional collections of orange guild quartz. So as you can see, the dyes are very different and maybe that can help us in taxonomy. Hypomyces lactiflorum, the lobster mushroom. This is one of my favorite mushroom dyes to work with. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see what happens when you dip it into an alkaline solution. It goes from that beautiful salmon-y red color to the hot pink magenta. And on the other end is bright orange. That end's been dipped into a vinegar solution. So this is like the litmus paper mushroom. You can get all sorts of colors just from messing around with the pH modification. Gold, you can get gold from so many different groups of fungi, from the yellow poured boletes to gymnopolis to the yellow quaternarius. There is no shortage of gold. Um, also the Dyer's polypore. So these are all examples of the Dyer's polypore. If you had to describe this mushroom, it's really hard to do because at every stage of its life, it looks a little bit different. You can see really young, it's kind of blobby. And as it gets older, it gets uh, darker brown. As long as the pores are intact, it still has a lot of dye in it. Um, if you flip this one on the bottom right over and you rub your finger across the bottom and you look at your hand and it looks like coffee grounds, it really doesn't have much dye left. You can still play around with it, but you're not gonna get those vibrant yellows and emerald greens that you would get from the younger specimens. And this is what it looks like on silk. Alum mordanted in the front and iron mordanted in the back. This is the dead man's foot, um, also known as the dog turd fungus. And on the bottom right, you can see I found the dog turd fungus next to some coyote poop. Um, and so it's important to uh, poke at this lightly <laughs> before your identification. I also find, found it ironic that it was growing in the cemetery. It's a great dye mushroom. You can get rich browns, oranges, and it's a really strong dyer. Blue-green dyers. These are Felidons, Bolitopsis, Hydnellum, Polyozelis, the Lepharas, and so much more. Um, these fungi are affectionately called the tooth fungi, though some of them don't have teeth and um, they, I don't, I don't know how you approach learning this group of fungi, how to like tell them apart, but uh, they all have very similar dye reactions, all in kind of this blue, green, grayish uh, reaction. So they all require an alkaline extraction. So using washing soda and most of them require pre-mordants like alum or iron. And the silk unfortunately does not take these colors so well. There are a couple of exceptions, but for the most part, it's best to just work with wool on this one. 
These are some examples of the blues that you can expect from this group. And these are what some of the fungi look like. So we have Hydnellum ceruleum, Suaviolans, which smells like oatmeal cookies, Hydnellum pecchii, the bleeding tooth fungus or strawberries and cream, and Bolotopsis griseia. Thalephora, I've seen a lot of that out in the last couple of weeks. Thelodons, they're coastal and probably starting to come up. Polyozelis, the um, blue chanterelle. This is a really strong dye fungus that makes uh, almost a blue black color. And sarcodons of all varieties uh, are worth trying, although there are a few that do not produce dyes. Sarcodon fusco indicus is probably my favorite dye mushroom. You can get these really intense, deep blue green dyes from these mushrooms. Moving on to tapanella. This is the velvet footed tapanella or velvet footed pax formerly known as. And this mushroom gives uh, purples similar to the jack-o'-lantern fungus, which is kind of, you guys are in the Humboldt area are kind of on the line between both um, fruiting areas. So you'll see both Omphalotus further inland and you might see Tapanella out in the forest um, on the coastal side. So Tapanella is, uh, gives these beautiful purples without mordant. It's really easy fungus to work with. You would never guess it has that purple by looking at it. Uh, and then if you add iron, you can get this really deep forest green. And this is probably the most exciting dye mushroom of California, and it's called the Western Jack-O-Lantern, Omphalotus olivacens. Not to be confused with the Eastern Jack-O-Lantern, Omphalotus ludens, and others. Uh, this has a very special dye chemistry, which also makes purples and greens. It stains your hands orange for a week when you pick it, but can you get orange dye? No. It makes beautiful purple, and then the darkest green pretty much ever. The coral fungi and woolly false chanterelles make beautiful purple dye. Now these are um, one of the dye fungi that they're, are the exception to the rule of um, drying your fungus. These mushrooms have to be used fresh. They need to be in good condition and like young specimens and fresh specimens. They don't work as well when they've been frozen and they don't work at all after they've been dried. So get these mushrooms fresh, just use the more fungus to the fiber ratio, the better. So two to one, three to one fiber, or I mean fungus to fiber. So more mushroom than fiber. And you will get these um, beautiful purples but you have to pre-mordant with iron. All of the other tester samples will give you zero color. So it only works with pre-mordanted iron fiber. And then I always like to throw this mushroom in as an honorable mention. It doesn't, it's not found in California, but it has been found in Alaska. Uh, it's been found in British Columbia. I suspect it's probably in Northern Pacific Northwest. Um, but it is very common east of the Mississippi, although it's the size of a quarter generally. So it's hard to find. It's just this little tiny cinnamon polypore. And from this fungus with an alkaline extraction, you can get the most beautiful purple dye. Light fast, wash fast, excellent dye maker. So if you're traveling or if you're tuning in from outside the California area, keep an eye out for this mushroom in the early season uh, next year. It starts fruiting in the Northeast uh, about May, June, and continues on throughout the season. I'm gonna mention lichen dyes really quick, but that's really another talk. But there are a few lichen dyes that are easy to use and commonly found in your area in California and also in areas beyond. Although we're not so lucky to get the next lichen that I'm gonna show you, but Xanthoria parentina is very common across 
the, across North America. It has this amazing ability to dye beautiful pink after being soaked in ammonia for at least a month and a half. It makes this beautiful pink dye that then turns blue when exposed to sunlight. And the strands that you see on the right hand side were, expo were exposed in these little twists that you see in the middle and then dried and then opened up. And once it's dry, it holds those color changes indefinitely until it gets wet again and exposed to sunlight. So it has to be wet to turn to that blue. But once it's dried and if you've blocked out some of that color, you can retain that marbled pink and blue effect. Really a special dye maker. And then this is Flavopunctelia flaventier. It's very common uh, inland and in drier parts of California and beyond. We don't find it here in the Pacific Northwest, but I found it all over. Um, I found it in the Midwest. I found it in the Southeast. I found it in the Northeast. And I suspect it's in more places than I've looked. So this fungus or this, um, lichen, which is a fungus, uh, has this capability of making this amazing deep purple dye, but it needs to be soaked in either ammonia or stale urine uh, to transform over the course of a month and a half to three months. So remember, the journey is the success. Though you might not get bold dye colors right off the bat, Enjoy the process of learning about fungi. Enjoy the process of looking at different fungi. Out of this lineup of corals that I found within a five foot area, none of them produced purple dye, but they're all so beautiful. And even though I didn't go home with dye that day, I learned um, about my regional fungi. First thing to do is convert your foraging friends to hunting for dye mushrooms. Um, this is my friend, Teddy. He used to hunt for chanterelles and matsutake. And then he learned about cordinarius. And that is now what Teddy looks for. And such a good friend to have because he's very generous in sharing. And these are his clothes made out of cordinarius dyed fiber. Invest in the next generation. Kids love learning about fungi. I am so grateful to my mom for teaching me about mushrooms in the beginning and encouraging me along that path. And I just encourage you all to um, share this joy with the youngest members of our society. Forage responsibly with friends. This um, was a social distance foraging event um, just with my closest mushroom dye friends and we foraged almost all of the dye mushrooms for dyeing all of this fiber that we all brought together and it's a new it's a new frontier learning to um, explore things together safely um, it's something that it's a learning process and we're all just starting to embark on that Celebrate your bountiful harvests. Don't be afraid of showing the love for these dye fungi. Um, join your mycological society so that you understand the life cycles of mushrooms and or do your own research online or in books. Uh, it's just such a pleasure to be able to use mushrooms in this way and to access uh, learning about fungi with a focus uh, like dying with mushrooms. You don't have to eat them. You, you can simply explore their color. Share your creations and inspire others. Uh, the Mushroom and Lichen Dyers United group is so inspiring. And to see creations from folks all over the world and to hear stories about people's journey uh, ex experimenting with dye fungi, it's just it's so important. And especially now that we're all kind of pulled away from each other physically, um, it, keeps, it keeps us all going. And I wanna say a special thanks to the women of mycology who have inspired and invested in me. Um, without these folks, these ladies, um, 
I wouldn't be where I am today. And also a special thanks to Noah Siegel for contributing a lot of the photos that were in this talk and for um, sharing his love for fungi with everybody. And special thanks to HBMS for having me here. So thank you all. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. <laughs> I have been accumulating a list of questions. There was one right at the very beginning where somebody asked if all of the colors used in the Facebook event photo are available from fungi within the Pacific Northwest. Um, what photo was in the Facebook event photo? I don't remember. A rainbow of colors. <laughs> <laughs> um, I it off of your website. Oh, it is. Um, Oh, those are Pacific Northwest colors. Yes. Cool. That's fun. Okay. Next question. Do you have a list of resources that you mentioned in this talk somewhere? I pointed people toward your website, um, but I wasn't sure if you had a list of those books you mentioned. Um, the website and then the Facebook group is really the best place to get all of the information. I know not everybody is on Facebook, but it reaches the most people. So that's where a lot of the information is. But if you um, have any specific questions, you can always email me directly. I'm happy to share that. And what I forget even what the name of that Facebook group is exactly. Oh, Mushroom and Lichen Dyers United. Nice. <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> any issues with over harvesting mushrooms and lichens? Yes, on the lichens. So lichen, and the lichen talk really is a separate talk. I could spend hours talking about lichens and how to harvest them and how they're different from mushroom dyeing. But as far as mushrooms go, um, you know, you always want to be respectful of what you're harvesting. However, mushrooms are abundant in certain areas. And the risk for over harvest is very minimal. Um, and I, I mean, I think that it's best to learn about these fungi by learning their life cycles because each specific fun fungus kind of has a different story to tell. And this is an opportunity for you to learn that story. So harvesting boletes, you know, for the dye pot, they are mature and They've already done their sporulation, so you're not interfering with their growth cycle at all. Um, harvesting dyer's polypore, it's a pathogen in the forest. You're not interfering with its life cycle at all. Um, but there are some fungi that are that you do want to be a little bit more careful with. And like the tooth fungi, the felidons, the hidnellums, they have a delicate mycelial mat. And so learning a little bit more about each specific group of fungi is important before harvesting. Harvesting lobster mushrooms, go for it. So many out there. <laughs> you can never find all of the mushrooms either, no matter how hard you try. <laughs> That's so true. I have two questions for you about pee. So the first one is any idea how medications in urine affect dyes? No, there is no documentation on this as at all. So um, I encourage you to experiment and document <laughs> and tell us all. Please tell us all. <laughs> I'm so curious. And if you go on Mushroom okay. and Wires United, you can read the full write up from Sue Gazelle. And I think she talks about that in, in the write up. So. Awesome. Second question. What kind of stale pee are you referring to in order to make dye color stronger? My pee? My dog's pee? <laughs> you can. So there are historical accounts of using other animal urine. Um, for my experiment, it was human urine and it was your own. It was, you don't, not everybody wants to work with something else's urine. So if you're wild enough to experiment with urine at all, best start with your own. And to stale it, you just leave it in a jar covered for a few weeks. It's really, it's a gross experiment in that it smells so bad. Um, but some people have to do it to know. 
inquiring minds <laughs> must know. And then you have to tell us all. <laughs> yeah, and then tell us all. Take pictures, not of the peen, but the pee. <laughs> tell us how it goes. <laughs> Okay. Um, how clean do mushrooms have to be before you use them for dyeing? So I am not very picky about the soil content. I do try to pick them as clean as possible, but, and I know a lot of people say that the soil can interfere with the dye process. My feeling is that if we could use regular Pacific Northwest soil to make dyes, we would. And the fact that we don't means that it probably isn't going to contribute too much to the dye pot. So I don't worry too much about it. And the, the dye goes all the way down to the base of the fungus. So if there's some dirt at the bottom, if there's pine needles, if there's duff, I don't worry too much about it because if those things were dye sources, we'd probably be using them or not. Nice, okay. Does if you have more questions, post them in either the YouTube or in the Zoom. I'm out of questions currently. Um, but I do have, you have so many just positive feedback, wonderfulness to you. And you got a shout out from the Netherlands. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It was, it was really fun. And Wait, there's, there's more ooh, questions I, in the Q and A. Okay. Oh, that totally didn't show up for me. Okay. I have them. Um, here comes a bunch more questions. <laughs> Um, I've heard someone having trouble extracting blue from Sarcodon fusco indicus, which was a four to one mushroom to fiber, mushroom soaked with soda ash overnight. I'm suspecting it might be a pH issue, but was curious um, what you think might have gone wrong. Any tips would be great too. Yeah. So working with Sarcodon or any of the tooth fungi for blues, there are a few things to keep in mind. Premordant is essential. So premordant with alum or iron has to be done, preferably days before you actually do your dyeing. So you let that mordant set in there, you let it dry into the fiber before you even think about dyeing it. Um, pH needs to be about a pH nine or 10, sustained throughout the whole dye process. So if it gets, there are all sorts of things that contribute to the pH shifting but you want to just kind of check it every so often and make sure it's staying in that range. Um, too much fungus to fi or too much fiber to fungus is another thing that can go wrong. Four to one, I don't know if that's dry or fresh, but if it's fresh, it might not be enough. If it's dry, it's way plenty and it's probably a temperature issue or a pH issue or a mordant issue. It's, there's a learning curve with all of this. Okay, question about Western jack-o'-lantern. Is that found in Southern BC? No. Unfortunately, its range peters out at the Oregon border. So the California-Oregon border. And um, that's as far north as you're gonna find that mushroom. Okay, what about mordants? For iron mordant, what do you use and where do you acquire it? So ferrous sulfate is the other name for iron mordant. And you can go online and buy ferrous sulfate from a lot of different sources. I don't think Dharma Trading Company sells it anymore, but if they do, that's a great place to get it. Um, Mewa up in BC, um, Vancouver, BC carries it. Uh, Earth Guild on the East Coast, I often order it from them. Uh, if you do a search for ferrous sulfate, you should be able to find uh, the powder. And I think you can even get it at some feed stores. Does alpaca fiber behave differently from sheep or goat wool? Yes. So all of the fibers behave differently. This is the fun of mushroom dyeing is that there are no truths. Everything reacts in every way a little bit differently. So you can have wool from one sheep next to wool from another sheep and have totally similar but different results. Alpaca um, has a different cuticle on the fiber, so it takes the dye a little bit softer. Um, but I've seen alpaca work really well and with certain species of fungi. So there are no hard, fast rules. If you have alpaca fiber, it's 
and that's what you're working with, then you, that's a great fiber to work with. It's going to be different than sheet fiber, but it's great. Can you use a dye pot made from copper, iron, aluminum, or tin in lieu of using powders for mordants? This one's, I, I, I have pretty like, I started with powdered mordants. So my standards are based around powdered mordant results. So I've tried working with a iron pan, like cast iron pan for iron effect. And I found that it just, it isn't enough for me to be like, oh, this is working wonderfully. I want it to be just a little bit more than the iron pan has to offer. So there, um, some people are more comfortable working with like rust, rust from nails and um, kind of their own iron liqueur that they've made from rusty debris. But when I did my experiments with those, I found that it was just so much sludginess that I was just more comfortable taking an eighth of a teaspoon of iron powder and working with that instead. Um, as far as tin, I don't think you're gonna be able to get um, much of a result from that. Uh, alum, you can use things like the deodorant crystal, that's alum. Um, you can buy alum from the grocery store as the pickling salt, that's alum. So there are ways to work with alum. Aluminum pot is not gonna do it at all. You probably won't get any effect from that. I'm just right now being super impressed by how much you know about all of these questions. Copper uh, pot. I'm going to keep asking you more questions. You can work with. So a copper oh, pot, nice. you can put a little bit of an alkaline solution in there. I generally use a little ammonia and swish it around and it will strip enough of the copper off of that pot to make an effect on your fiber. So that's the one exception. Definitely a copper kettle is worth investing in if you can still find one. So speaking of copper and toxic stuff, do you have any experiences dying with toxic mushrooms? How would it turn out and how safe is it? So there are a lot of mushrooms that are dye makers that are not edible. Um, so, and there's a, gradi there's a gradation on what is toxic and what is deadly. And as long as you're not ingesting your dye bath, as silly as that may sound, you're going to be just fine. So um, every time I teach a class, there are a handful of people in the class that say, oh, it smells so good in here. And I just kind of shake my head and wonder, but <laughs> never be tempted to drink the dye bath, obviously. <laughs> and, um, but the fumes from mushrooms don't make people sick. It, you really have to ingest it to get sick. There's one exception to that rule and it's a European species that you're not going to come across and have any sort of problem with um, in the US. The most deadly poisonous mushroom on the um, dye palette that I use regularly is that little tiny Hapalopolis, the cinnamon polypore that makes that purple dye, knows at the end of the talk. And that is deadly poisonous. Um, it doesn't cause any effect on the fiber. It doesn't cause any effect um, in the you know, in the proximity of the dye studio. Hopefully you're doing this in a well-ventilated area, um, mostly just for the mushroomy smell. Um, yeah, I, I use non-edible species all the time and it's not, it's not a concern. Once you wash the fiber after you've dyed it, it's all, all washed out anyways. I always like to remind people that our commercially dyed clothing contains very toxic dyes. And we don't think, most of us don't think twice about clothing our families in commercially dyed clothing. So. A very good point. <laughs> uh, you got a question from Jocelyn who says, I've used dried fungus that is, or I have dried fungus that is five plus years old. Can I still use it for dye? Oh yeah. You can dry these things and they will retain their dye potential indefinitely. All right, and then we have another one here. Does the mushroom dye need heat to apply to the protein fiber? Um, yes, so you need to simmer the fungus 
for an hour and you can throw your fiber in at any point. Um, the traditional method is to simmer the fungus for an hour and then simmer the fiber in that extracted dye water for an hour on top of that. So it's a two hour process, but you can get away with doing it all at once and simmering it for an hour and a half, or you can, some of these fungi, you simmer for 15 minutes and they're done. And all of that is the minutia that makes this um, something you don't just learn from one talk. <laughs> it takes experience and practice and season after season. It's a wonderful hobby for um, taking things slow. And a great way to just do science experimentation. Yeah. Um, somebody asked for spinners, does anything special need to be done in fiber preparation or can roving just be used the same as yarn? So one of the things I didn't talk about is scouring the fiber and scouring fiber is a process of heating um, the fiber with uh, some sort of detergent or soapy solution that will pull lanolin and any other um, things that might be coating the fiber before you actually dye the fiber. So if you're a spinner and you're, you have fiber that's just um, a fleece, you, you're going to need to wash it really thoroughly first to get all of that lanolin off. And um, if you're a spinner, you probably know how to do that gently so that you're not felting your fiber. And um, other than that, that's all you would need to do. I, if I'm dyeing fleece or um, roving, I put it into the bag and um, the paint strainer bag rather than putting the fungi in there to keep the bits out. It just, it um, creates a little bit more of a barrier to keep mushroom bits out of your roving. But if you go to card that roving again, the, the bits will fall out anyways, but that's how you do it. <laughs> All right, and then we had a few questions about um, the sort of fastness of the dyes. So can you wash mushroom dyed fibers in a washing machine? Um, well, if you're working with wool and silk, you're gonna wanna be careful washing your fibers. Um, mainly just agitation will felt wool, obviously. And so you don't wanna throw your like freshly dyed sweater into the washing machine. Um, as far as washing goes, you can wash these uh, I recommend just using a few drops of whatever detergent you use, preferably something pH neutral, um, but a few drops of dish soap or a few drops of uh, shampoo, hair shampoo um, are usually what I use to wash my fibers and just plenty of water and then really gently swish it around in, in water and kind of press the water out and then hang it to dry. And mo all of the dyes that I mentioned today are what I would call fully light, light and color fast. Um, there's some exceptions. The blue greens tend to change over time to what I call get it patina. And it just is kind of a doling of the brilliance. It doesn't, they don't necessarily go away, but they do shift a little bit. And the same with the purple of the jack-o'-lantern. You're gonna see a little shift over time. Okay, and then we had one about using mushrooms to dye your hair, and mm -hmm. you did show a picture of using the lobster mushroom. Are there, can you use any of them? Well, I mean, you can try. Um, part of the thing with the mushroom dyes is that you have to have that sustained heat for an hour and pre-mordant. <laughs> so if you're willing to pre-mordant and hold your head next to a pot of hot water, I don't think it has to be like simmering, but it has to be hotter than you would actually apply to your skin. So there's definitely some caution to be had if you're going to be experimenting with hair dyeing of, with mushrooms. Um, there are a few mushrooms that are strong enough that would probably work just cold. Um, like the dyer's polypore, David Aurora has a picture in All of the Rain Promises and More of, um, dog with his chest dyed in a woman with a shock of hair. And both of those were cold dyed, I presume. And so that mushroom can be strong enough to actually get some amazing results with just a cold extraction. 
That would be so fun. Um, we had another question about homemade mordants. Um, so you already addressed the topic of homemade mordants in general, but what ratio would you use for those morbid mordants to fiber? Um, well, I don't know about homemade because you're, there's no way you're going to have a pure enough product to actually give a ratio. Um, unless you, your home is in a lab. Um, <laughs> and then they probably wouldn't be homemade anymore. Um, but with rate with mordants in general for alum, I use 15% dry powder to the weight of the fiber. And for iron, I use 2% powder to the weight of the fiber. For tin, it's 2%, and for copper, it's 2%. Okay, I think I have addressed all of the dye-based questions, I think. I might have missed some. There's like three different spots I'm looking. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, and thank yeah, you for all the folks that asked all those questions. They're great questions. Thank you, Alyssa. It was you wonderful. You had such a wonderful talk. <laughs> Thanks. And yeah, if anybody needs to uh, send me questions, mycopigments at gmail.com. It's the best way to reach me. Take care, everybody. Alyssa. Stay safe. Keep your social distancing Thank up. Thank you. Nice not wearing you. up. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Alyssa. Thank you. Bye.